So you said it, uh, morphemes, lots of questions. Yeah. So yeah. Mor morphology is what? The study of morphemes? Morphology is the, is the connections between the morphemes onto the roots, the roots. So in English, we mostly have suffixes. We have en endings on the words, not very much, but a little bit. And uh, as opposed to prefixes, some words, depending on your language, can have, you know, mostly prefixes, mostly suffixes, or mostly, or, or both. And then even languages, several languages have things called infixes, where you have some kind of a uh, general uh, form for the, for the root, and you put stuff in the middle. <laughs> you change the vowels. That's stuff fascinating. Like that. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. So wait. So in general, there's what two morphemes per word? Usually one or two or three. Uh, uh, well, in English, it's 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 one or two. In English, okay. it tends to be one or two. There can be more. You know, in in other languages, you know, a langu language like uh, like Finnish, which has a very uh, elaborate morphology, there may be ten morphemes on the end of a root. Boy. Okay, and so there may be million. There be millions of forms of a given word. Okay. Okay, so I, I will ask the same question over okay, and yeah. over. But uh, <laughs> how does the just uh, sometimes to understand mm -hmm. things like morphemes, it's nice to just ask the question: How does these kinds of things evolve? So you uh, have a great book studying sort of the um, how, how how the cognitive processing, how language used for communication, so the the mathematical notion of how effective a language is for communication, what role that plays in the evolution of language, but just high level, like how do we how does a language evolve with where English has two morphemes or one or two morphemes per word, and then Finnish has infinity per word. <laughs> so what? How does that? How does that happen? Is it just pe people? That's a really good question. Yeah. That's a very good question. Is like, why do languages have more morphology versus less morphology? Yeah. And, and I don't think we know the answer to this. I don't. I think there's just like a lot of good solutions to the problem of communication. So I like I believe, as you hinted, that language is an invented system by humans for communicating their ideas. And I think we it comes down to we label the things we want to talk about. Those are the, the, the morphemes and words. Those are the things we want to talk about in the world and we invent those things. And then uh, we put them together in ways that are um, easy for us to convey, to process. But that, that, that's like a naive view. And I don't, I mean, I, th I think it's probably right, right? It's naive and probably right. Well, but... that's I don't know if it's naive. I think it's simple. Simple, yeah. I think naive is, okay, okay. Na naive okay, is an right. indication that it's an incorrect, yeah. somehow it's a trivial, yeah. Yeah. Uh, too, too simple. I yeah. think it could very well be correct. Yeah. But it's interesting how sticky, it feels like two people got together. <laughs> it, just, it just feels like once you figure out certain aspects of a language that just becomes sticky and the tribe forms around that language. Maybe the language, maybe the tribe forms first and then the language evolves. And then you just kind of agree and you stick to whatever that is. I mean, these are very interesting questions. We don't know yeah. really about how words, even words get invented very much about, you know, we don't really, I mean, assuming they get invented, <laughs> they, we don't really know how that process works and how these things evolve. What we have is kind of, uh, a current picture, a current picture of a few thousand languages, a few thousand instances. We don't have any pictures of really how these things are evolving, really. And and then the evolution is massively, con, you know, uh, confused by contact, right? So as soon as one language group, one group runs into another, we are smart. Humans are smart, and they take on whatever is useful in the yeah. other group. And yeah. so, any kind of contrast which you're talking about, which I find useful, I'm gonna I'm gonna start using as well. So, I, I worked a little bit in um, in in specific areas of words, in in number words, and in in color words, and in color words. That, so, we have in English, we have around eleven words that everyone knows for colors, mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, and many more, if you happen to uh, be interested in color for some reason or other, if you're a fashion designer or an artist or something, you may have many, many more words. But we can see millions. Like if you have normal color vision, normal trichromatic color vision, you can see millions of distinctions in color. So we don't have millions of words. You know, the most efficient, no, so the most uh, you know detailed color vocabulary would have over a million terms to distinguish all the different colors that we can see. But of yeah. course, we don't have that. So it's somehow, it's been, it's kind of useful for English to have, have evolved in some way to, so there's 11 terms that people find useful to talk about, you know, black, white, red, 
uh, blue, green, yellow, purple, uh, gray, pink, and I probably missed something there. Anyway, uh, there's there's eleven that everyone knows. Yeah, and um, and depending on your and but you go to different cultures, um, especially the non-industrialized cultures, and there'll be many fewer. So some cultures will have only two. Believe it or not, that the Danai in in Papua New Guinea have only two labels that the that the group uses for color. And those are roughly black and white. They are okay, very very dark and very very light, which are roughly black and white. And you might think, oh. They're dividing the whole color space into you know light and dark or something, and that's not really true. They mostly just only label the light, the black and the white things. They just mm-hmm. don't talk about the colors for the other ones. And so, and and then there's other groups. I've worked with a group called the Chimani down in um, in Bolivia in South America, and they have three words that everyone knows, but there's a few others that are that that several people like and that many people know. And so they have me it's just kind of depending on how you count between three and seven words that the group knows. Okay. And uh and again they're they're black and white. Everyone knows those. And red, red is you know like that tends to be the third word that everyone that that cultures bring in. Nice. If there's a word, it's always red, the third one. And then after that it's kind of all bets are off about what they bring in. And so after that, they they bring in a sort of a big blue-green space, grew, yep. grew. they have one yeah. for that. And then they have, uh, and then, you know, different people have different words that they'll use for other parts of the space. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. anyway, it's, and it's probably related to what they want to talk, n- n- what they, not what they, not what they see, because they see the same colors as we see. So it's not like they have, they don't, they have a, a, a weak uh, a, a low color palette and the things they're looking at. They're looking at a lot of beautiful scenery, okay? Mm-hmm. A lot of different colored uh, flowers and berries and things. And, you know, and so there's lots of things of very bright colors, but they just don't label the color in those cases. And the reason probably, we, we don't know this, but we think probably what's going on here is that w- what you do, why you label something is you need to talk to someone else about it. And, mm-hmm. and why do I need to talk about a color? Well, if I have two things which are identical and I want you to give me the one that's different and, and the only way it varies is color, then I invent a word which tells you, uh, you know, this is the one I want. So I want the red sweater off the rack, not the not the green sweater, right? There's two. And, and so those those things will be identical ex- because these are things we made and they're dyed and they're, there's nothing different about them. And so in, in industrialized society, we have... Mm-hmm. You know everything. Everything we've got is pretty much arbitrarily colored. Uh, but if you go to a non-industrialized group, that's not true. And so they don't. Re- it's not only like they're not interested in color. If you you bring bright colored things to them, they like them just like we like them. <laughs> bright colors are great. They're beautiful. They are, but they just don't need to. No need to talk about them. They don't have. So probably color words is a good example of how language evolves from sort of function when you need to communicate the use of something. I think so. Th- then you kind of invent different variations. And uh, and basically you can imagine that the evolution of a language has to do with what the early tribes doing, like what what they want, what, what kind of problems are facing them and they're quickly figuring out how to efficiently communicate uh, the solution to those problems, whether it's aesthetic or functional, all that kind of stuff, running away from it mammoth or whatever. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's so, so I think what you're pointing to is that we don't have data on the evolution of language because many languages have formed a long time ago. So you don't get the chatter. We have a little bit of like old English to modern English because there was a writing system mm-hmm. and we can see how, how old English looked. So the word order changed, for instance, in old English to middle English to modern English. And so, it, it, you know, we could see things like that. But most languages don't even have a writing system. So of the 7,000, only you know a small subset of those have a writing system. And even if they have a writing system, they it's not a very modern writing system, and so they don't have it. So we just basically have for Mandarin, for Chinese, we have a lot of a, a lot of evidence from from for a long time, and for English, and not for much else, not for Mandarin German a little bit, but not for a whole lot of like long term um, language evolution. We don't have a lot. Well, we you just get, have snapshots, is what we've got of current languages. Yeah, I, uh, you get an inkling of that from the rapid communication on certain platforms, like on Reddit, there's different communities Mm -hmm. and they'll come up with different slang, usually from my perspective, driven by a little bit of humor um, or maybe mockery or whatever. It's, you know, just talking shit in different kinds of ways. And uh, you could see the evolution of language there because um, I think a lot of things on the internet, 
you don't want to be the boring mainstream. So you like want to deviate from the proper way of talking. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of deviation, like rapid deviation. Then when communities collide, you get like, uh, just like you said, humans adapt to it. And you can see it through the lens of humor. I mean, it's very difficult to study, but you can imagine like a hundred years from now, well, if there's a new language born, for example, we'll get really high resolution data. On. I mean, Eng English is changing. Eng English changes all the time. All languages change all the time. So, if, you know, there's a famous um, result <laughs> about the Queen's English. So the que if you look at the Queen's vowels, the Queen's English is supposed to be, you know, Originally, the proper way for the talk was sort of defined by however the queen talked or the king, whoever was in charge. And uh, and and so, if you look at the how her vowels changed uh, from when she bec first became queen in 1952 or 53, when she was coronated, the first—I mean, that's Queen Elizabeth, who's got who, who died recently, of course—until uh, you know, 50 years later, her vowels changed. Her vowels shifted a lot, mm -hmm. and so that you know, even in the sounds of British English, in her, her, the way she was talking was changing. The vowels were changing slightly. So that's just in the sounds, there's change. I don't know what's, you know, we're, we're, I'm interested, we're all interested in what's driving any of these changes. The, the word order of English changed a lot over a thousand years, right? So it used to look like German. You know, it looks. It used to be a verb final language with case marking, and it shifted to a verb medial language. A lot of contact, so a lot of contact with French. And it became a uh, verb medial language with no case marking. And so it became this, you know, verb, verb initially thing. So, and so that's it's evolving. We well, it, it totally evolved. And so it may very well, I mean, you know, it doesn't evolve maybe very much in 20 years is maybe what you're talking about. But over 50 and 100 years, things change a lot, I, I think. We'll now have good data on yeah. it, which is <laughs> that's great. That's for sure.